Hey everybody, welcome to another PureMix stay at home webinar. I'm here with the amazing Joel Hamilton today. Joel, how you doing? Good, man. I'm really glad to see you. You as well. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be really fun. So Joel, for anybody who doesn't know, is a producer and mixing engineer and general badass that's based in Brooklyn, New York, and works out of a place called Studio G that's amazing. Um, we'll have to go into that a little bit. Uh, right on. And to do a little bit of the, the name dropping thing, uh, you've worked with Tom Waits, you've had some smash hit success with Highly Suspect, Bonobo, Iggy Pop, all kinds of people. So it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here with you today. And um, right no, on. not to forget Pretty Lights as well. That was incredible. Yeah, time, so. sure. Pretty yeah. Lights as well. Yeah. So um, we have a bit of a interesting concept for today. So we've been doing all kinds of um, all kinds of stuff on these, really. Just like we've done Geek Talk, we've done like plug-in roundups, we've had multiple people on at the same time, we've done live mixing sessions. Uh, two days ago, we had um, two producers creating a beat live on camera from two different locations. That was crazy. Wow. Cool. And today I'm excited because um, this event is super unique in the sense that we're going to get a little bit into the weeds on the pursuit of finding better. Mm -hmm. And uh, our other portion of that is developing our compass, um, the aesthetic compass, right? Yeah, creation and calibration of an aesthetic compass. That's yeah. been the overarching theme throughout. Right. Yeah. So a little bit of background on this. You've been um, you've been doing a lot of teaching recently and both like in in class formats. Uh, I know you've done some teaching in India um, yep. and then you've been doing one on one sessions recently as well. Right. I have been the one on one sort of grew organically out of the more lecture based uh format you know so it was kind of if i went and did a visiting artist thing at berkeley and then had office hours type of things where people could schedule individual quick little one-on-ones that were more like quick consultations on a project they were in the middle of or things like mm -hmm. this it started to grow organically from that when everything moved online to the point where it was like okay well why don't we actually look into what it means for us to pursue these ideas. I mean, it, all of a sudden it seemed sort of twice as ridiculous for me to just talk about an equalizer in the, when, the, when the ultimate goal was how to apply it to the circumstances that, that the student was then gonna find themselves in. Right. Rather than just a peer even, there was something where I felt responsible to somebody who still considered themselves a student and I was already out there in the workforce. So even just making that distinction I felt more compelled to start to drill down on why I do what, a, what or why any of us do what we do in the pursuit of better rather than just mm -hmm. talking about a particular piece of equipment used in the pursuit of better. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, full disclosure too, I've actually had the pleasure of doing two of these sessions with you now. Um, and both times I walked away just with all kinds of new concepts and stuff. And I'm excited that you're going to uh, get to share a little bit of that today with everybody that's watching. It's amazing. And and like I said before, it's it's amazing that the it goes to a a, a deeper level and a, and a more fundamental level when there's somebody on the other end of the one on one sessions that does have, you know, a, a sort of baseline that they're working from where they're they're already in the marketplace or they're already, you know, they're already doing stuff. And, and so it's a, it's been amazing to me to to recognize that the concept scales up and down rather than that the approach I need to take scales up and down. So when I'm talking to somebody with like platinum records hanging behind them and, and ultimately it's the exact same conversation that, that you and I had or that me and like an 18 year old student from Mumbai have. Mm -hmm. And that, because it's, it's like a way to plug in variables into yourself and come up with sort of a clearer solution, you know? And, mm -hmm. and in that sense, I mean, I start to border on, you know, like I'm trying to form a cult around this or something, you know? <laughs> but, but at the same time, I've been amazed at how well these concepts seem to cut, cut in line, you know, they sort of get all the way back to the beginning of the line of why we were ever compelled to search for better, you know? Right. 
right. and what that means and, yeah. and, and helping to define that for each person rather than for each situation, because clearly that changes with every project for me, for you, for Reed Shippen, for Felipe Alvarez. It's like there's a different there's a different best mm. that requires sussing out in any given situation in this position. It's part of what I find interesting about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, so a little bit about how today will work. We're just going to um, go through some of these concepts to start off here. And for anybody who's watching, uh, our chat room on YouTube is going to be our main chat room today. So if you guys have questions, make sure you head over to YouTube, um, join the event there, and then submit your questions in the event. And we'll, we'll circle back to them in a little bit here. Um, so let's dive in. There's a lot of ground to cover. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah. for me, the the entire concept came out of the notion of of the 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 illusion of transparency in audio and where that actually came from, because the illusion of transparency in engineering has never been something that I actually felt like was very successful, in the sense that nobody's ever tricked me into thinking that somebody had broken into my apartment with a cello and started playing, you know, in my living room. I've I've been aware of transducers being involved since I was six years old, even if I couldn't mm -hmm. articulate it with that word. And, and so ultimately, what then is the engineer in the service of when we're pushing up a fader? I mean, why, why does it stop at a certain point? Mm -hmm. and, and it's so interesting to me that when I started to look at this, I saw that it, it's like better was this tiny little spot and then worse seemed to go on forever to mm. infinity in this direction and worse went on to infinity in this direction in all directions worse is all around us and yet we pass through better we sense it and then we sort of go back to it you know it's so interesting mm -hmm. that it's like it's rare that somebody pushes something up whether it's a fader, an EQ plug-in, it doesn't matter what the piece of equipment is being used to affect the, a change on the source. But ultimately, the, it's like we sort of pass through better. And, and in that moment, I, I started to recognize that I could slice all of this down based on that moment alone as an analogy for our whole way of working, which was the notion that when we transition and the moment that we transition from all this equipment that you see around me here, when we transition from that gear being a discovery tool to a tool for execution, much like my guitar when I'm writing or a whirly when I'm sitting down and figuring out a melody, it's a tool for composition in that moment. It's a tool for discovery rather than for execution. I'm not playing a show, so what am I doing? I'm looking for, quote, the best path through the, the harmonic structure or whatever, I'm writing a part. And, and so looking at that sort of moment of inspiration where people always seem to describe it, like where they just looked at the other elements in the room and wrote it, you know, or like there's always this sort of disconnect that, that the final kind of judgmental leap from the cognitive description of why to then the proactive. It's like it was like that transition was the thing that was missing, because clearly it's like you can get an idea in your head, much like if we were going to paint a sunset and we had to pack up a finite number of colors of paint in the car to go down to Coney Island where I can see it better than I can see it from the window in my studio. It's like I would know from historical precedent because I had experienced it before that I was going to bring some reds, oranges, yellows, you know what I mean? Maybe some blue. And because that means I can make the green of the ocean down in, right. in Coney Island. So ultimately, I can be reductive in that and narrow it down. Like, even though every single one is unique, you know what I mean? All of them mm -hmm. are slightly different and all of this, but we can be reductive and we can kind of break things into some categories and start to have a proactive idea mm -hmm. as to how we're going to use these tools. And it's, it's always been interesting to me that, that the big leap from actually like packing up the colors based on historical precedent to then just doing it seems to get skipped in a lot of the discussions about why we all do as engineers and producers what we do. Mm. Yeah. So I started to kind of look at the notion that there's this, this hierarchy in the, in the logic path back to what, you know, and I was like, what is it? What, are, what am I basing any of my decisions on really? And it was interesting to me that I kept landing on compositional intention. 
Mm. Just like I'm using historical precedent as the idea that I've seen, you know, to define that I've seen a, a sunset before. It's just sort of a fancy way of putting that, that I'm using historical precedent to make a proactive decision about this evening. I haven't seen the sunset yet this evening, East Coast time, New York City. Mm -hmm. But I have an idea because we saw it before. And so ultimately, it's the same idea. We've got massive amounts of historical precedent with recordings. Right. And, and it's so interesting to me that if we take a look at it in the sense of a map, meaning somebody's walked up over that hill and saw what was there before, before us, and there's a lot of people who came before me, you, any of us that are watching this right now that did recordings, let's say, mm -hmm. produced, engineered, composed music. We have a whole bunch of definition. We have a bunch of detail or data points on that map. And then we have no idea where to go, just like a globe or the map is not the territory. Historical precedent isn't the whole reason that we decide to make a snare drum sound like what we make it sound like. Right. So that got me in, into this whole idea of having an aesthetic compass, mm. because all we need to know when we have a map, which is historical precedent, all we need to know, all our compass needs to know in that moment to find any point on that map is north. And all we need to know in the context of what we're looking for in any given production that I'm in the service of mixing, it's like, I just need to know better. From there, the EQ is easy, man. There's a finite right. number of points I can even click on a 1073. I've only got so many choices of what to do to it. EQ, compress, turn it up or down. Mm -hmm. Is it an amplitude choice? Is it, a, is it a, a shape to the frequencies? Like, what is it that, why am I doing any of this shit? Right, <laughs> you know? right, 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 yeah. So what finding thing? that better point to me, only knowing one thing in the studio becomes incredibly valuable and that's better. Right. And it's, and it's fucking elusive. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, well, the, the big thing about this stuff that I love, and this is something, um, I, I harp on this on these things a lot because it comes up with pretty much everybody that we talk to on here in some way or another, uh, just organically it comes up and that's, um, intention. So that word to me is um, is key for everything and why like everything that you've been talking about uh, in the one on ones that we've done really resonated with me was it's all about this. So um, having intention of knowing where you're going and then doing motions or moves that bring you to that point. And, it's so interesting uh, that like when you when you raise the idea of intention, that if we if we use the hierarchy of compositional intention filtered through production vision and then engineering in the service of that production vision, it automatically is engineering in the service of the composition. And it's so interesting because it's why I use uh, Star Wars as an example, because absolutely zero moments in that movie took place in space. Right. It all had to be designed to give a representational notion of space because number one, we're experiencing this in two dimensions. It's on a screen. Mm -hmm. And so when the director is looking at the screenplay and the, and the book, let's say, is sort of compositional intention. It's the overarching narrative. It's why this exists at all. It's the story, man, you know? Yeah. And so then the director, which is more like us at our production, you know, role, when the director is then looking at how it needs to transition from a guy in a furry suit running around in some desert mm -hmm. outside, you know, outside <laughs> L.A., it's mm -hmm. like into something that's now Chewbacca saving somebody's life in space. He's actually looking at a two-dimensional representation of it because it's what's in the shot that matters. Right. None of the sort of 3D aspects of it matter at all. And I started to see that in the, in the idea that I can look up, I'm gesturing at my live room, I can look up mm -hmm. and, and look at the live room and ultimately understand that what's happening in there is needs to be shaped in a way that works as a 2D representation. Mm. And as a producer, I need to make that transition from 3D to 2D effectively, much like the director might have the actors stand at weird distances from each other because in 2D, mm. it has to look like they ran all the way to the vanishing point, but he still wants them in the shot. Don't right. actually disappear up over the next dune in space. You know, like you've got to only be... Mm -hmm. 
15 feet back to give the illusion that you're really trailing behind when the bad guys are chasing you because at that focal length and with that amount of lighting and that particular like you know f-stop the mm -hmm. depth of field is right to make somebody look out of focus and way behind you it's like my hand i've said it before my hand just got zero inches closer to any of the viewers and yet right. we know how to interpret that gesture my hand didn't just get so big that i'm like yeah. hiding behind it you know <laughs> so ultimately it's like making that transition from compositional intention to production vision and then engineering in the service of that for me was the first place to start as far as reducing the logic of why i'm doing anything that i'm doing with eq faders compression effects right and it interested me that when I got into where the answer lived pulled out of context, meaning what's the answer as to what's better, mm -hmm. when I pull something out of context, like the evil solo, when we're using solo during, during uh, mixing, which we shouldn't be doing anyway, we should be listening in context because it's all that matters. But let's say that we just have a vocal on its own and we then are, are thinking to ourselves based in like a room that's tuned that it's slightly bright or dark. It's like, how are we determining that relative right. to what? Relative yeah. to life, you know, relative to yeah. standing in the room with them. It's like what we determine that based on usually seems to live in the mid range, mm. even of one specific element. It's, and and I use the term the DNA. It's like the DNA of the mix lives in the mid range and describes how much low frequencies it will tolerate or how many you know how much high end it will tolerate before the general group of people watching this that have ears and brains and understand music would call it bright or dark right right even on its own because that mid-range dna of the vocal then seems to carry the information i need to then go that's that was recorded kind of dark or with a dark mic or the, the limitations of the transducers, whatever it was. And then you look in context and you start to read the intention behind that. Is it supposed to sound like Billie Holiday? Well, then all of a sudden it's not particularly dark, is it? Right, right. Or it is, but dark is good. So we can slice that in a bunch of different ways as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a mastering engineer that we've had on here before, Brian Lucy, has talked about um, having fences that we play within. And like, uh, yeah. you know, like moving to one side of the fence or one the other side of the fence and the fence is uh, he describes it as the fence is the entirety of recorded music in history. Or whatever. Sure. And then the reference sure. point of that and the contextual thing that you're saying is um, that's key to the whole thing. Right. Because I could just play you something. Um, let's say like I did a very dark recording and I didn't tell you that I was going for a 50 vibe or a 50s vibe and let's say i missed the mark and i like i lost all the other things that would have been cool about that like limited bandwidth or or whatever and it's just kind of dark and not saturated or whatever um and then you hear that and you say it's dark or whatever right because... of course well but because the intention would not read clearly in the compositional or the production intention that's why we can't just low pass a fucking Sugar Ray song at 3K and expect it to sound <laughs> old school. You know what I'm right. saying? Like we can't take like a, you know, a Chumbawamba track and just like band pass it right in the middle at 1K and yeah. have it feel like we've then expressed that perfect idiom of, of old timey music. Right. Because it's not just, it's, it's so interesting that this, the cyclical nature of this for, for me has stayed interesting that mm. it's like the gestures and the way the melodies were written were written to a particular playback format. And so people who had a particular sound like Edward R. Murrow, the famous guy who said, oh, the humanity when the Hindenburg, you know, he was like the, right. the announcer. People who had voices like that actually translated better on single little speakers when it was like just AM radio and all or pre that shortwave, you know, and ultimately mm -hmm. it's like that helps guide what's aesthetically correct for any given paradigm. Mm. So it's not just within the context of the production and the, and the compositional intention. It's sort of like then filtered through the paradigm of the day, meaning our reality. And the more perspective we have on the history of recording, the more we can start to just slice it up and, and say that sounds 70s. But it's like it would sound kind of 70s, even with lots of high end and lots of low end if we sort of gave the gestures that sounded kind of like 
Jamiroquai or something, you know, where right. it was clearly recorded in the 90s because you listen to those production techniques and the way it's engineered. And it's so 90s. And yet there's like a tip of the hat, a tip of a giant big dumb hat to to the uh, a particular era. You know what I mean? Like, and it, but that's because the compositional intention filtered through what still felt new and fresh and didn't just feel like a Stevie Wonder ripoff mm -hmm. because of the way it was filtered through the paradigm, like the, the, the inherent kind of texture of the day it came out. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So I want to try something real quick that this might yeah. fail. I just had this idea. So um, let's say that I'm going to be, uh, you're going to produce my, my song today. Right. Yep. And we come in and I say, all right, so I have this thing. Um, it's kind of, uh, Motown, it's kind of Motown. Uh, what do, what do you want to do? Well, I mean, if we listen to the demo and we, and we then both were like, wow, okay. It's totally built into this, that even when you recorded it on your phone in the rehearsal space, your use of tambourine and the way that the bass relates to the bass drum, you know, and things like this is like immediately kind of giving us that vibe, mm -hmm. even before we decide on one microphone, you know, and then ultimately, if we wind up thinking about what would be a good mic choice for a bass drum or a good mic choice for snare top, let's just isolate those two things, if we're going to do like a Motown thing, but being played today, kind of the same way that like Amy Winehouse has a lot more low end in it you know what I'm saying, than actually Motown does. And there's sort of a different mm -hmm. clarity and a different texture to it. It's like, why did we interpret it that way then? And a lot of it was in the compositional intention yeah. where they wound up making some bold moves in that, in that composition so that the only move necessary during the production phase was to allow those moves to filter all the way down to the mix engineer it's like this. It, it'd be the same thing if you said, I have a good song instead of a Motown song. It's like people always say like, well, you can't mess it up. You know, like a good song, you can't mess it up in the mix. You can do mm -hmm. anything to it and it's still a great song or whatever. And what ultimately people are saying when they say that, it's, it's true, but it's true because the intention is so clear all the way in that hierarchical kind of breakdown that it reads clearly, even if somebody misses the plate entirely when they throw their pitch as the producer and they record it in a way that should have been Sugar Ray instead of Amy Winehouse. And yet Amy Winehouse still goes ha ha and sounds old timey, even without using a 77 on her vocal. It could have been a 58 yeah. and, it, and it would have sounded kind of like the, she got the gesture, like the ball rolling in a particular direction with intention. I mean, the difference between noise and music is intention. Yep. Like straight up yeah. noise and music. The only thing keeping those two things in separate categories is intention, really. Yeah. Because yeah. we can have, you know, somebody playing the piano with their foot and yelling great balls of fire all out of the key and crazy. And it's totally music. Absolutely. You can have somebody playing angry tritones and out of tune guitars and all of this. And the minute that you fill up those opportunities, meaning that each note is an opportunity, once you fill up those opportunities to communicate something with the world and the intention meets the gesture, it actually does work. It elicits a response. Just like if you and I were walking down the street in a country where we didn't know the language, mm -hmm. we would understand what was being expressed just by the texture of it. We would know in Istanbul, whether there was like a wedding getting out or like a fight in front of a bar six blocks away, that would happen in, in Brooklyn before we could hear the specifics of it, before the narrative even begins in the literal sense of like the lyric in a language that we understand. It's why I love it. I love working on people's records in languages that I don't speak because I ultimately like I break that wall immediately and I have to sort of filter what's actually happening in the track gives me an idea of what's being expressed. And if it's off from that, once they translate it for me, it's like, then we've missed the mark in the textures we've created in the guitars or the keys or whatever it is, the way we're actually presenting it carries information before yeah. you ever hear the, what the lyric is about, you know? 
Right. And sometimes it can be, it doesn't have to be all academic. I'm only slicing this down in the service. We could do this with a reggaeton track that's only about kissing somebody or drinking or dancing. And the intention is so clear. It's actually a beautiful example of it because the intention is so clear in a reggaeton track where you just chant dance motherfucker like 10,000 times in the track. It's pretty clear what that track's trying to tell you. Like the intention is there, compositional yeah. intent. And if it's right. produced in the service of getting those people to dance, then it's like nailed it. And then right. if it's engineered in a way that engages the intended playback systems where people are going to be dancing, you've got something that's incredibly successful. Yeah. Meaning as a, as, a, as a piece of music successful, you know what I mean? I yeah. don't know if it's going to sell a billion copies or whatever, but it's successful as a, a piece of art. Well, with a lyric like that. <laughs> How could you go wrong? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, here's, here's something interesting, though. Um, so forgetting about mixing for a second and all of that stuff, um, talking about the performance of that guy saying that, like in his song, the difference between him like commanding it and just saying like dance, you know, kind of like sheepishly is going to yeah. have a huge difference on that. And that's that kind of goes into intention as well. So exactly. That's why this starts to feel like a mechanism, almost like the Turing test. It doesn't tell you an outcome. It just tells you that you can filter a bunch of th variables through this criteria and wind up finding better mm -hmm. by using this criteria. And it's why I've been so excited about this. If this dude, if, if I was saying what I was saying without any enthusiasm, because I've been discovering this for yeah. myself, the idea that the idea when I told you in, in one of the ones that we did, I'll just reference that we had, we had talked about this before. Yeah. But if, if, if I told you in, in one of the one on one things that I was actually excited about the fact for my own career that when I started to recognize as a producer that I could make three big, bold moves in a, in a production and the way that I finally figured out to determine what they would be is what SNL would parody or what somebody would parody mm -hmm. about my hit. If I had something I thought could be the single and it maybe had a shot to be a hit because it had the infrastructure, like the right A&R, the right label, like mm -hmm. people behind it, it was good. It could possibly really be heard by a lot of people. I started to understand how important it was to be able to make fun of it and render it down to like two basic moves of like what would be the parody. Like if if we went ba 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 ba, anyone knows that we're then doing some kind of joke involving Billy Jean yeah. as the source material, because they nailed it in one move. And when we talked about, I'm sort of referencing something between you and I that I haven't let the viewers in on that the three bold moves, the concept of having at least one, and then three or less bold moves in a production or mix or composition total seems mm -hmm. to be the umbrella that when I talked to Brower once about this, it seemed to be the umbrella and a bunch of other people. It seemed to be the umbrella under which any big song lives. Mm -hmm. Like anything that he was involved in, he said it kind of had that. And it really stuck with me when he told me that. But then I wanted to know why or how I figured it out for myself. How do I figure out what those moves are? Because yeah. it was a really important, it, it felt important coming from somebody who's had a lot of hits mm -hmm. come across his desk, you know? Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, I started to recognize that if if I created criteria that was too extravagant for people to actually be able to keep their hand up in a room of a thousand people, the more I increased the criteria to be able to agree with me, the less hands were going to be up at the end of this really long list. So if I said to a thousand people who here was born and they're like, eh, OK, but you don't invest yourself in that. That's like no bold moves have been made yet. Right. just like elevator music we forget it immediately as humans we just have mm -hmm. nothing to invest ourselves in and then immediately if i said who was born on a tuesday the people who still had their hands up would be much fewer and they would look around the room and start to see who still had their hand up and then i keep increasing it like who was born who took a taxi you know whose mom took a taxi to the to the hospital who was born after midnight who was born when it was raining out and all of a sudden i've got like this list of 10 things that you need to agree with. It needs to be something that, that actually fits you to keep to be able to keep your hand up. So I've made right. the criteria incredibly specific to be a part of the group that can say yes to my song. 
Right. And sometimes when it gets out past three or four, it'll get described as willfully challenging and it'll really speak to a few people in a way that totally helps them find their place in the universe. Meaning when people first started to, to react to something like a Rubik's cube, look at how many of those were sold. And ultimately it's an incredibly heady concept that's being expressed. And yet stoners still liked it because it just had like these trippy colors on it. And it was like difficult and it was kind of a puzzle. And yeah. so people do like it to be challenged, but not to the point that they feel stupid. Just like when I got to meet the design director of Braun from like the 60s, like from their heyday, Dieter or something, something. And he wound up telling me that bad design makes people feel stupid. Mm. And so if I needed to include 500 knobs on something and I still hadn't made it better than a 1073, why would any of you choose it? Right. Somebody managed through great design to just make a couple moves and it then creates this Venn diagram where like the most crisscross happens yeah. of all the groups of engineers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Smart kids, less smart kids, me, <laughs> you, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. everybody seems to like, you know, there's more agreement. And in that way, that's why I keep using the word consensus. We wind up with consensus giving us part of that sort of ability to calibrate some sort of gauge towards better. Just yeah. like if we made a horrible decision early in life, our moral compass maybe said it was a good idea. And then you get pushback from your community, whether it's your church, mosque, temple or family or whatever friend group. Mm -hmm. It can be your gang, man. As long as somebody gives you this feedback, it's going to calibrate your moral compass. And it's yeah. why things get crazy in small groups, because six of us can form a cult and decide that we only like eat dinners on rooftops and wear sneakers when like comets go by, you know what I mean? Like, and, but we yes each other into thinking that. Right. So with cons consensus is a powerful thing for human beings. Absolutely. But when we yeah. use historical precedent and then bounce our moves off of consensus, we wind up with a rebound that gives us a massive amount of information as to where we should be pointing for better. Because if we throw it at the world and it bounces and ricochets off into the woods, maybe we didn't find something that really landed back in our laps that we can be proud of. Right. It was kind of a wild pitch in that sense, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I loved, um, I'm going to like lead the witness a little bit, but I love uh, the, the portion where you're discovering or you're discussing, like if you were to get in a boat off of the, you know, in Manhattan right now and travel. Can you go on with with that? Yeah, absolutely, because awesome. it speaks to a really important aspect that we started with kind of in this conversation, which was the notion of gear being making the transition from discovery tool to tool for execution. It's like we recalibrate by using EQ along the way. If the destination mm. is the best mix that we can give the band or the A&R or the management, all the community that requires consensus to say, yes, that's the one. We're going to use Rev 1 or Rev 2.9 final slash the date vocal comp 2 slash final dash final edit right. comp. It's like, really so if we're this going to one. use one of those, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if we're going to use one of those, it's like along the way, we can get the idea that London is where we want to be and we can head out of New York Harbor with just kind of the idea, just only knowing north we can then determine the east. The compass is never going to point towards London. It's going to keep pointing towards north. And we make a decision to head towards London, which is pretty much due east from where I'm sitting. Yeah. And I can then not know the finer shades. It's not quite fully calibrated yet because it's just my initial idea for your Motown demo. Right. Mm -hmm. We know it needs to go east. Right. We're going to say that Motown is east of here. Yeah. So basically, I'm going towards London. And all of a sudden I land on a beach where I hear French and Arabic kind of interchangeably. And I'm going to go, uh, this is Morocco. <laughs> you know, like, and, and so then from there, though, with that, using that as a discovery tool, I can recalibrate. It doesn't mean it changes where the thing is pointing. It means that I wound up somewhere based on finer shades of that general East idea. I made it all the way across the Atlantic. That means I might have already delivered one mix. 
And the right. revision notes that I got, had I hit London in the first place, would have been much less than if I had delivered Morocco. But now I can turn and, and head straight towards London. I may overshoot it, hear Norwegian, understand, you know, and then we refine by yeah. then hearing Welsh and then Scottish. And then finally, we're like finding the restaurant that you and I are supposed to meet at in Soho. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, it's so interesting to me that all of that information along the way would inform a finer shade of destination. All of it, mm -hmm. even if Morocco seems like it's not even in the same universe as the restaurant I'm trying to find in London, the only way that I can find it until I've got finer degrees marked on my compass or a finer shade of bright or dark for what Motown sounds like, I can kind of get it in the general direction and make some mic choices and actually start to what I hate that people use the word commit. I can start to commit to a particular path. The reason mm -hmm. I hate using that is because if you don't tell me that you EQ'd it on the way in, let's get nuts and bolts for a second. Yeah. I have no idea what the hell was committed to. I just hear that the kick sounds, quote, right, based on the greater context of what's being expressed by compositional intention and by production vision. So if mm -hmm. you engineered in the service of those two things, then committing in the quotes that I hate to a particular shape of kick drum means that if you were reading those cues correctly, then it's in the direction it needs to go. And I'm just going to be happy when I push it up as the mix engineer that it all fits together brilliantly. Right. Now, right. any move, any move outside of the compositional intention and production vision is a wrong commitment. It's why I hate the idea that one is committing and one is like just sort of letting it go, bro. Like, let's chill. Right. Like if I using the quote that I always use, which is that the founder of the New York Times said, I really just seek to hold a mirror to the events of the day. And ultimately, in about two seconds, a bunch of New Yorkers were like, well, that's bullshit because who's holding the mirror? And like, you know, what's what's your agenda? <laughs> and you have yeah. an agenda even when you set up a microphone and the microphone has its own agenda. The mic pre, there's something imparted along the way by every single one of these stages. And if I've made a decision about something that supports the greater narrative by using like an EV666 on the snare top instead of a 57 or a Revox 3500, mm -hmm. the only reason that that matters is because, because it might be a brand new modern rock record that uses the oldest mic or it might be, you know, Whatever it doesn't it doesn't mean that the age of the mic equals the age of what we're trying to do in the production, right? Like they're supposed right. to sound old. I've used plenty of things like with the Black Rock Black Keys thing where it was supposed to sound old, like a sample, and I used a Beta Fifty Two made in night, you know, two thousand two, as an overhead because it had a super fucked up like high That's end crazy. spike yeah. and then roll off, and that sounded like a lot of the breakbeats that we referenced. That there was this weird like five, four, like three to six K peak and then rolled off for vinyl on the drums and they felt very mono. Right. But the point is, is that that if we call it a commitment, it's like that infers that I then made some like irrevocable decision for no apparent reason. It takes it removes the context from it when we talk about committing. And so if I was hearing you just speaking to me in the room. And just like I got an idea in basic ranges, low, mid and high, let's say, about what it means to sound like Mark Abrams. And then you went out into the live room. I would reduce the number of microphones that I needed to hear you speaking through mm -hmm. if my goal was just to keep recording this conversation. So it sounds just like you. What I would ultimately be listening for would be priorities. Mm. So it's like when I hear it, a particular way it's going to feel like the glass came down rather than being aware of the transducer like you talking through a 47 sounds like you through a transducer and coming out of speakers after being amplified by a 1073 right but then you all of a sudden we find one of the mics that's an equivalent whether it's 251 a 49 67 one of the classics one of mm -hmm. them it's little sort of static frequency chart is going to have priorities built into it inadvertently that match up to the way I was just hearing you in the control room. 
right. and de-emphasizing what I don't care about. So if there's a little bit of 180 that comes down in a 67, nobody jump on me about this. I'm, I don't know the chart offhand for a 67. Mm -hmm. But if there's a little peak and a little valley right where I need it to be, we're going to determine that that's, quote, a better mic choice for Mark than one that has weird priorities and they're weird only based on like what's up and what's down in your voice inherently. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that gets spun into this sort of purist idea that then got spun out into some weird notion of being too sort of in the service or like being held hostage by the sound that a snare drum's making in my live room. I'm now just a slave to that forever and I can never find anything that's more flattering than that original event. Right. And ultimately, like when, when we listen to anything we've ever heard recorded, what we're hearing is priorities. And it starts with that microphone. And I don't mean my priorities like ego based. I mean, the priorities of a 57 as described by what it listens to the most and what it listens to the least it's going to sound the least like they were transducers involved in the context of all the other elements. And suddenly we have something that becomes quote, a classic choice. Right. right. You know, it's that, why um, drilling down on something, even like a 57 to me, this still applies the same sort of mechanism that I'm talking about. It still applies as to why that was better in so many circumstances in like rock records or whatever, where there's a snare drum and guitars. Right. Yeah. And, that idea and you know circling back to the very beginning of it of um you know nobody's fooling you that there's a cello player that snuck into your apartment although that'd be pretty funny um yeah. that when you kind of can let that go and then realize this is my canvas i'm shaping what do, what, what do i want to paint today um that whole thing can be very freeing and, and we talked about this before too but i was um i was telling you how i have always felt like sometimes i'll i'll walk into the booth while a singer's warming up and you know we're going to put up a mic or whatever and the sound of them warming up is like with a great singer it'll just like blow you away it's like wow that sounds amazing and then you go back in the control room even after finding you know like a mic that complements a singer really well it's still not that you know it's not standing three feet away from an incredible voice you know right yeah but what's so interesting though is that's the same as like it wouldn't be Star Wars to be standing there while they're filming it. And we just see the dude put on the Chewbacca head and run around in circles with like yeah. some fake gun and go pew, pew, instead right. of like actually seeing lasers <laughs> and all of this. It's like, and yet when we add all those effects, they would be corny if they weren't in the service of the overarching narrative. Right. The effects in the literal sense of like, now we can see light come out of the gun Right. when Chewbacca shoots it like what? Yeah. <laughs> none of that is, happens yeah. I mean it, it's what's so interesting to me is like when I listen to Back in Black by ACDC what I'm hearing is not ACDC I'm hearing the two-dimensional representation of these guys filtered through production vision that ultimately made the transition from being ACDC to being ACDC recorded into something that became a classic. They right. got bigger after Mutt Lang gave them the right transition from 3D, them as humans doing their thing, transition to the two dimensional world coming out of our speakers became something sort of more perfect in, in like a pickup truck cranked up when it first came out. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And it nailed all of the sort of elements, just like I said, of making people stand in particular places so that it made that transition correctly. It wasn't just because they sounded fucking awesome. It's why we don't just have live records of all of our great musicians. It's like, well, then why isn't every single goal of every single record just to record them every night they play and then pick the best night and we're done? Right. We're done. Right. It's like, there you go. Live is it. You know, that's the barometer by which we gauge all other things. It's so interesting that this 2D world has a lot available that doesn't exist in our reality. Mm -hmm. And yet we can create a compelling narrative by using everything that we have. I mean, ultimately, every technique that we have speaks to a physicality that does actually exist. And even the idea of like a lightsaber has to drill down on some kind of cultural touch point to make sense. Mm -hmm. And it's good because like 
the heroes of yesteryear, like the Three Musketeers or Arthurian legend, you know, King Arthur, Excalibur, the, the guys with, with honor use swords and like right. the gangsters and the mafia use guns to just shoot you with no intention and yeah. no like heroic intent. And so all of a sudden we have a lightsaber being handed to our hero in Star Wars. I mean, the only reason I use this, this particular narrative is because it uses only cultural reference points to be able to make sense at all to humans. Right. There's right. no way to make sense of the information being expressed, like Death Star. Right. You know what I mean? Like, or, or like whatever, like Darth Vader. You know what I mean? Like none of it. It's like until yeah. you dress him up a particular way, meaning you give a 2D representation of it and it supports the overarching narrative that in the story, he's the bad guy. And we have this hero that comes from humble beginnings with a land speeder with dents in it. You know, a land speeder, by the way, right. that thing was designed to give us the idea that there were humble beginnings for this guy that ultimately becomes the hero and changes the course of the galaxy. And every move in that movie, every single thing in that movie or experience in that movie was by design rather than by default, because there is no default position unless you're going to a galaxy far, far away and just filming the documentary about Luke Skywalker, you know what I mean? And even yeah. then, you're holding the mirror. You have to have an agenda as to how to create a narrative that's compelling or right. serve a pre-existing narrative that's compelling with a two-dimensional representation. Here's a really, we're getting way into the weeds here now. Yeah. There's a guy named Lucretius who was like an Aristotelian disciple in Greek myth, uh, mythology, in Greek uh, philosophy that wrote a book called, or had like a, a series of books called The Nature of Things. And ultimately he was thinking about the idea of, is it any less real for me to hold a Greek and a Roman coin in my hands if I look at them on edge or I look at them as the circle representation of it and then recognizing that it was equally real and yet a lot of the information goes away from our perspective on it if I was then trying to give somebody the illusion of, the be of being able to judge the differences between these two coins without actually sending them the coins. I could take a picture with any cheap phone at this point, and if I take it on edge, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the coins because he looked and saw they were about the same. It's like a nickel and a 500 rupee coin are about like the same size, and they have a flat edge instead of even the little ridges that would give away that it's a quarter maybe. Right. And all of a sudden, when we turn them, though, if I shoot it from that angle, I give all the information the viewer needs to understand that it's bigger, smaller, different, whatever it is. Like we find our bearings and we find better. One's going to be shinier if I shot it on edge. So what are we what are we actually doing then when we're giving a 2D representation of snare drum? We have to figure out where to look at it from that it's going to tell the most people the most amount of information that this is the perfect snare drum for this context. Right. right. And it's usually where we looked at it from. Even with the mirror, we'd be better served by looking at the mirror ourselves than looking at the 3D thing and trying to aim a mirror to give you a reflection that shows the viewer if there's something happening just outside the frame. I should be looking at, like, I need feedback. And so we either look at our own little square yeah. You know, in the monitor, we look at what we're doing or we actually need to look at the mirror and see what I'm representing to the world in my limited area that I've been given. And those are like headroom specs. Those are track count. Those are any of the limitations that we've right. always been up against, whether it was a tube mix bus to tape or whether it's Pro Tools or Ableton or whatever. We've always been up against a finite quantity that we can budget in the service of telling a story ultimately. So we need to prioritize when we're telling that story. If we've got a finite amount of space to do it. Think about it. If we just were like, you know what? Books are corny, man. I'm just going to put every word on paper and bind it. We'd yeah. make a dictionary. We wouldn't make a story. You know what I'm saying? We would wind up with that. Yeah, and it would have yeah. all the form of a book. It would have, you know what I'm saying? It right. would look just like a book. Because right. it is a book and it tells no, there's nothing there. Yeah. And so 
ultimately it's like we wind up with a story where we put these pre agreed upon ideas. We use historical precedent to make a noise with our face like this apple. Everybody just pictured an apple. You can right. picture it because language is metaphor. And therefore the representation of snare in the mix is a metaphor for what happened in the live room or for what happened when ACDC played in an amphitheater or like a football arena, they weren't trying to get the sound of compass point mm. into back in black. They were yeah. giving the sound of those guys engaging like 25,000 people at once. And so even the compositional intent of these big slabs of guitar and the tempo works and everything about it, the intention of that is like, this is just going to push air in a gigantic space. So do we record it in a fucking football stadium? No, it wouldn't right. matter where they recorded that as long as like the equipment wasn't broken. You know what I mean? And then they wound up in a mix room where they could make decisions accurately, but about the intention that was built into the composition and the way it was produced to make that transition to two dimensions. Right. Cause we can't bring that football arena to your house and have you experience that. But yeah. we can give a really compelling, possibly more balanced and better sounding representation of what it would be like to stand there on the best night. If that's the goal, you know, if that's the goal, we can give a better illusion than what's actually out there. Right. Absolutely. Um, OK, so can we try application a little bit? Yeah, sure. OK. All right. <laughs> cool. So this thing. Um, here's the thing that wouldn't happen to you, but it might be funny if it did. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe it does happen. I don't know, but let's say, um, let's say you have a band, um, or you hypothetically have a manager and your manager calls you and says, I want you to work with this band. They have no demos. Um, I honestly can't tell you what they sound like because it's my brother's sister's uncle's nephew's band yeah. or whatever. I need you to make a record for them. Um, they're going to show up tomorrow morning. What's the first thing you do when they show up tomorrow morning? Basically, I would be setting up some minimal generic mic setup to start to see how they translate with whatever it is they're about to do at me. Mm -hmm. The same way that I would have a digital back on a large format film camera just to get the composition in, in visual terms correct before I started blowing off film with a bunch of people that I don't know what they're about to do. I don't know if they're jugglers. I don't yeah. know if they're going to make a human pyramid or they're supposed to just stand right. side by side. <laughs> so I'm going to see what I need to do and I'm going to run it basically straight through a tape machine, let's say, because I usually start on tape. I'm going to leave it on input. And I'm going to use Pro Tools as the digital back. And I can just leave that recording the whole time. Even when I walk in the other room and tell them an idea, when yeah. I start when I start calibrating to what they're expressing, I might leave it on so I can hear myself talk in the room mics yeah. when I had an idea of like how we could pursue better. And then I'll come in and listen to it again, which is the director looking at the 2D representation of all the actors, that even a good director, if he doesn't know what the scene is about or any of that, after like one run through, you'll go, you know what? You're fucking just out of the shot. So like, let's start there. Let's get everybody yeah. back into the shot. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then and then from there, we'll figure out like your initial kind of idea was that you run away from the main character and you come back. Right. So a good director is going to start helping to guide that action, which is to run away, but only go to this mark. So you're not completely out and then run back. And it's yeah. still the entire gesture remains intact without actually losing you. Just like when a drummer plays some super spazzy fill going into the chorus. And I'm like, uh, there's that's like massive, sketchy rhythmic divisions going into like an 80 BPM rock chorus. We've just devalued that 80 BPM like crazy with a gajillion 30 second notes going into it. Like three bars worth of, you know, like freaking out yeah. into boof. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, know, right, right. Feels, yeah. Like I'm going to know that intuitively from historical precedent. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read compositional intention and start to go, okay, the song wants to get bigger there, but through that one variable that I've heard on one run through, I've then understood immediately that that's now out of line 
only within the context that they're defining. Yeah. If you if you're using the entire studio as a discovery tool, it's amazingly powerful as a production element. Like I can wind up using like I'm now a producer using my entire studio as a discovery tool rather than me being a mix engineer and using the top end shelf on the SSL as a discovery tool as to how much air I want on the main vocal. When I'm looking at it as a producer, I'm looking at it as making it transition from what they are doing now to a better representational idea of what they're trying to say and have it come out of the speakers clearly and within that intention intact. Right. Right. And so much of it, so much of it is just like, it's not, this like old idea of this iron fisted like do it again you suck you know on yeah. the on the talk back <laughs> so much of it so much of it is like people that come in especially on a particular level when you start working with people who are doing things on the charts and mm -hmm. selling a bunch of records they probably got a pretty good idea already yeah but even when they don't what you're doing is really like compositional intention means it exists for some reason mm -hmm. And we need to be good at looking at what, why that is. Why do they think it's a good idea to do all these things in the composition? And sometimes it's as simple as that the idea is as great as any hot air, beautiful hot air balloon. And I just have to go in and snip off about six sandbags that's keeping it from going to where it needs to go. Right, right. It's not like that I need to like deflate it, light it on fire, punch the drummer and like <laughs> run back into the control room like, yeah. We're going to break them down and build them back up. You know, like it's Alpha just producer. that way. Yeah. Right. I've never seen anyone get better at math by being told that they suck at math. You right, know? right, right. There's this weird old school, like mean 50s, like military dad version of production that yep. I just, it, thankfully, I feel like this is phasing out a bit as yeah. we evolve as a species, maybe. Right. And, right. and ultimately for me, again, then how do we do it? Just like the subtleties of raising a child versus just like, smacking them when they do bad you know what i mean it's like right. then how do you do it what are you left with as tools because people couldn't see it in 1954 let's say right there was no way like how could you actually yet. build develop some form of ethical compass mm -hmm. something that actually like a moral compass that guides ethics how do we decide right or wrong based on those experiences and they were using their historical precedent but that was incredibly myopic, maybe one generation back, maybe two. And now we have recorded history back to the invention of like the wax cylinder to draw on to start to make a more refined decision about how to get something better out of another human being. Mm -hmm. right. And it comes through recognition of better first. And it seems we weren't that far off from good right when they walked in, if they've got a couple songs. Right, right. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's go one step further with the the yeah. um, example and practice here. So, uh, the nephews, cousins, sisters, uncle of the managers, nephews band, um, they just got together a couple of weeks ago and they all met on Craigslist. One of the dudes <laughs> has a uh, uh, Avenged Sevenfold shirt on and uh -huh. like the most gnarly metal amp in the world. They're playing a ballad song that the the lead singer is a huge Jason Mraz fan. Yep. And so we've got metal guitar guy and then we've got the drummer who's like playing the ballad beat and then goes into the 30 second thing. How do you guide the compass at that point? Well, for me, it's it's definitely about the composition still. I mean, because we've all been faced with this where there's definitely like some bridge that the like sleeveless Metallica shirt guy in the band wanted the banjo player to do it 32 times. You know what right, I mean? It's like, right. it's just so like such a mismatch that you can't believe it because it's like mm -hmm. the Craigslist drummer with the like sleeveless black Metallica shirt on and only master of puppets is cool. Nothing after ride the lightning <laughs> at all. You know what I mean? Like just a super like dyed in the wool. And yeah. so basically like what we wind up with is, being able to read the sort of topography of what they're delivering, in my opinion, when I can even just look at the meters and understand that there's something clouded mm. in the something cloudy about the intention of, let's say, the bridge, for example, mm. in the example you just gave, where it's like they want it to do a particular thing. And they means two out of the three piece or three out of the four piece mm. all seem to dig in there and see it as the high point in this journey they're taking me on, like where the bridge mm. is like chorus plus 
instead yeah. of the bridge yeah. being sort of like a chance for narration or like kind of verse plus or somewhere between yeah. the two. It's like, and the drummer goes to like crash ride bashing and everybody else sort of like just plays pocket and the singer's singing some sort of like long tones, but the cymbals sort of felt exciting in the, in the rehearsal space. So they sold it. Like the yeah. drummer managed to sell the like part right. that should have been in a total like metal song. I'm going to then China. have to read, I'm going to have to read that there's sort of like cognitive dissonance that there's dissonance in the sense of like the intention and the execution are now sort of like at odds. Yeah. Something between what the majority is telling me and what the one person in the band is doing, it seems to be not supporting the intention. Again, it drills down again on compositional intention. And if we find it, it's why like if they played it for me on an acoustic guitar before, if I just had that as pre-production, and mm -hmm. then I heard how hard because an acoustic instrument changes timbre with dynamics. Mm -hmm. If I just even heard it on a phone that they were blowing out the little phone mic or like that the, the guitar was like hit being hit harder. And then the drummer pulls back energy wise in that moment. That again would be sort of a, an intention mismatch. Mm -hmm. And so when right. you bring them, I would I bring people in when I'm using the digital back so that they see that the face they're making isn't as sexy as they thought when they were making it. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, when they come in and they see themselves going <laughs> at the camera, it's like, all right, man, well, maybe Somebody we want to, like, that, if, I, if I'm going to, like, then produce this shoot, you know, it's like, maybe just stand up straight and you look fine. Like, we'll make sure that your hair is done and right. everything's cool. You don't have to do that weird thing you're doing every time out of habit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big part of, like, directing a shoot is being like, what yeah. are you kind of trying to do right there? Because it's not coming through on my little 2D monitor here. The thing right. you're trying to express with like one eyebrow up yeah. isn't quite working. And a better actor is going to be able to do the one eyebrow up in the right Moment. narrative context yeah. and have it work perfectly. It's exactly the same thing. Right. Making a move, making any tiny move in the service of the story, for me, that's better making any tiny move away from it, that's worse. We're headed mm -hmm. away from better at that point. Even if we don't want to just use the term worse, it's right. different and it's away from better to me yeah. when it's outside serving the narrative. And there's always people who want to say like the outliers and it's like, well, what if mm -hmm. it's like a cool happy accident where they like smash the shit out of it and the juxtaposition is blah, 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 blah. Well, it's because they made such a big move that they fill it up with intention again and we get something like Portishead with gigantic, bombastic, over-compressed beats in the best gushy way possible. And then yeah. Beth's vocal is like really quiet and sounds like it's from some like old school movie. Right. We get this juxtaposition that then makes a whole new statement. And mm -hmm. that's what's brilliant about the 2D representation. They, mm -hmm. When Portishead was rehearsing, it wasn't just that like Adrian played his guitar super like at some volume and Beth just sang like, timidly in the corner and the drummer went <laughs> the whole time you know what I'm like this only sort of exists in 2d world and so when we start to explore the edges of our chosen medium which is recording we can make moves that juxtapose things where we would never hear it in the practice space we can't right. hear the mouth harp or the like little like harmonica solo over the rest of led zeppelin but we can as soon as we get amplification or mixing or faders involved and so all of a sudden the Beatles or any of these other people that used like wild juxtaposition of like a rubber ducky noise in the midst of like drums being hit really hard and the rubber ducky feels really loud and close to us. They didn't just get a 90 foot rubber ducky and record it with a pair of chefs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. Yeah. The, uh, well, yeah, here's actually, this is an interesting thing. So, um, we had, um, uh, two producers on the other day that worked with Timberland. And they were going over their workflow with it, and they were talking about how um, when the regular engineer that works with them is unavailable for whatever reason, and they bring in like a freelancer or something, the freelancer will always freak out because Timbo's drums are just like clipping like crazy, right? And yep. that is the sound of his drums. Like they clip, sure. that's it, sure. or whatever. But the engineer will be like, oh, we gotta, we gotta turn stuff down. Oh, it's your output to me. You gotta like, you gotta dip that back. And they're always just like, no, no, it's fine. Just, just do it. Yeah. And the yeah. guy, it takes him like a while to just be like, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. But the thing about it that makes it right is 
is like it is that intention thing and it's uh also tweaking to the portishead thing um was there a sound like that before i mean yeah like there's there's references to other things in the past in portishead's like delivery or uh the character of portishead but the the thing that really sells it to me is that there's no feeling that it was a mistake it's almost like the confidence of a performer and it's it's something that like kind of makes great performances really Absolutely. stand out to me too is like there's no there's no mistake about what they were trying to do there like it's supposed to be clipped and it's supposed to sound like that you know like man people i've said like. this i've said this to so many bands in my life at this point as i get older and get more gray hairs in my beard is that People drive long distances and pay large sums of money to be in the presence of confidence. And it's and it's amazing to me how that reads true, like across the ages. You know what I mean? It's like there's a pilgrimage to the person who's telling you exactly what God wants. Or there's like there's if you say it with conviction, it becomes the law. And, right. and ultimately, if we drill down even on laws, what we find is there's no bedrock. There is no absolute truth, just like there's no aesthetic bedrock that we can actually rely on. And it's why, again, I've been using the idea of a compass because it's something we can't see, taste, or smell. And yet we take north for granted when we're holding a compass. Yeah. And, and ultimately, when we wind up listening to, like I said, any recording we've ever heard, we're listening to priorities it's amazing that when the producer and the, the, the team that required consensus to say, yes, is, this is the one that's coming out. This is the version of Back in Black that's coming out. Once we had that consensus, let's say, ultimately, it sounds inevitable. Like every single great record sounds inevitable. That it, Of course, it's that way. Of course, the lightsaber, one is red and one is blue in the mm. original. And of course... Because, again, those elements were designed to suit the narrative. Our only way to assimilate the information and make our own decision about who's right or wrong, like maybe you were rooting for Darth Vader for some reason, you know what I mean? But he was cast into a particular role to be the one we want to die. Right. You know what I'm saying? Something right. as extreme as that. And you can find reasonable people sitting in a movie theater hoping that this fucker gets killed finally because of all of the evil he's done in the galaxy. And it's amazing that in the service of that narrative, in, that, in the service of that narrative intention or compositional intention, every little detail in that particular movie serves that. The yeah. shape and color of the, of the X-Wing fighter versus the shape and the color of the TIE fighters. I mean, it's like every single thing was de designed to support on a fractal level, it supports the narrative all the way from the micro and then you pull all the way back to like the overarching story and it's just good versus evil again for the billionth time. But it was repackaged in a way with cultural touch points that allow us to determine who we're rooting for. Because otherwise right. a space battle's kind of got no consequences for us because it's not real and we've never had one and there's nobody... We, there's no immediate threat so why the hell do we care who wins by the end of that right yeah and it's somehow okay to like have giant laser sounds in space because exactly you know and, and even yeah exactly yeah. even the sound was designed to seem realistic mm -hmm. and, and and it's amazing to me that even the sound of the way things look becomes a part of the moment when you're designing fx after they've designed the thing and it has a look, you have to design the thing's sound or right. soundtrack or whatever it is that, again, supports it. You know, like there's the soundtrack wouldn't be the same if the lightsaber didn't look like it does. The soundtrack yeah. to Star Wars wouldn't be what it is without the Death Star looking like it does. One thing informs the other without any doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I want to pull this back a little bit to a project that you specifically killed it on. Um, we did a video on this as well. It's on, on the Pyramix platform. Uh, it is a mixing video with you mixing uh, My Name is Human from Highly Suspect. And um, I think it was during our last Q&A, uh, we had a mixing contest for it after the video came out. And um, we whittled it down to the top 10 mixes and then Joel picked the top three. And when you were discussing the top three, 
uh, I think this is when when you talked about this or it was on one of our calls, but I think it was this. You you mentioned, I think, that the mixes that stood out to you were the ones that helped to sell the singer as the tattooed, like great looking, confident guy sitting on top of the mountain, like shouting without my name is Newton and all that. Without a doubt. It's yeah, definitely. Without a doubt, there was something about because that that song was so top down in the sense that the the vocal delivery drove a lot of the underpinning because i was around during the writing of that one and mm -hmm. it was it was the sort of hero shot of like circling the empire state building with johnny the singer with like his heels on the empire state building you know like with his back to it so he's mm -hmm. like standing like looking and, and saying this out to the city and and there's there's a particular physicality that that carried for me all the way through that informed a lot of the other decisions including even things that were very practical, like the fact that it's halftime, mm -hmm. you know, it's a halftime chorus and, and I'm sitting there mixing something that has to go up against like Foo Fighters and Green Day and Metallica yeah. all like jumping up and down, spazzing out like at a million BPM. And all of a sudden the label wants to work this thing that's like always on this like really slow yeah. halftime. I forget what the BPM is of that song, but it's, it's nowhere near anything Foo Fighters have ever done. They're always like a million. Yeah. So it's like looking at things it was going to compete with on Billboard mainstream rock charts and alternative rock charts. Mm -hmm. It's like I wanted it to feel more exciting than it actually was because of context. Because what's actually happening when you show somebody standing on a ledge like that is they're standing just like they're standing on the sidewalk telling you a story. And yet immediately when we put them a thousand feet up, we read this like crazy amount of energy into that. Right. Right. And the only, I mean, same shoes, same outfit, same hairdo, yeah. same tattoos for Johnny. And he's saying the same thing. But immediately when we put him 1,800 feet up or whatever, I don't even know. Yeah. It's not 1,800 feet. It's but like, you know, we put him, it <laughs> yeah, when we put him yeah. way up high, well, nobody becomes daring to say those same words because it becomes daring to say anything. So a simple statement couched in like a daring context still feels exciting to me mm -hmm. and so having all these stray frequencies in the guitars made it feel more exciting than just the fact that it's ultimately a two note modulation with a vocal over it mm -hmm. you know i mean it doesn't do a lot harmonically so it needed excitement to come from other places and there were people that read that intention in the tracks because in my opinion that was one of them on the record where i didn't sort of like take a left at, at the last minute and change my mind because I was the producer and the mix engineer on that. Yeah. It's like I didn't then produce in some idea and then get feedback from A and R that it needed to go over here. It was like this one was just like straight yeah. ahead. You know, right. to me that one was as straightforward as it could have been as far as reading compositional and production intention and then framing that chorus in a way that makes him sound like a superhero. And the top three absolutely understood that idea. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and that translates to even rhythmic divisions of like what delay is there and whether there's some reflections off of like the other buildings, the Chrysler buildings right mm -hmm. there, you know, versus this sort of short slap of us just being really close to them and hearing it right off the observation deck. Right. You know, as right. we fly by, you know, it's like yeah. there's a physicality to these decisions that ultimately to me, yet again, it informs what's happening in the audio, the 2D audio domain. It's informed by the physicality we're trying to express. Right, right. Um, yeah, and not to repeat that whole uh, um, Q and A, but there's there's one other thing about that that like it really stood out to me. And um, in a way, I didn't I didn't get to be on that particular shoot, but uh, talking to you on that Q and A kind of like one, it was like a head trip for a couple of days. It was really really fun. And then uh, two, when I saw that you were doing the teaching thing, it was like, oh, yeah, I totally want to do this. I want to see what he's talking about. So um, but one of the things that came up in that, too, was when you guys went to make the next record, you had a bunch of uh, things going on, both like with what they were going through personally on the height of success and um, just, you know, distractions and all that. You took them to South America, right? Mm -hmm. um, so For you that had this record, whole intentional because the thing. first record. It was because the first record had done well and we wound up with a gold single at that point, gold, and then and then two Grammy nominations on that first one. 
And it's the old story. They had like a lifetime to write record one. And then they've got like six months to write record two, you know, because we yeah. got to go here. And uh, and yeah, I took them down to Bogota, Colombia, a studio called uh, Audio Vision in, in Bogota that, that I love. And the people there are amazing. Like, I mean, at the studio, great team working there. And I've just loved that city for a long time. I've, I've done a lot of stuff there. Yeah. And um, and ultimately it was it was to bring them to get them away from yeah. any of the influences. It'd, it'd be like having a bunch of magnets in your pocket when you're trying to use an actual compass. It's okay. like I wanted them to be able to feel because they have a good idea, especially the primary singer songwriter mm -hmm. guy has a really great gauge of what's going to work. And when it's getting tossed all over the place by a bunch of external influence, he hadn't been in the business long enough at that point, I think, to really be able to like keep the magnets at the door and like still find a clear path towards better mm. toward in record two and be able to evolve as well, like as an artist. Yeah. Which I guess is the like sophomore thing and, and removing them from those that environment where they felt like they were getting batted around too much in the storm it meant that we could sort of get a steadier read on what was going to be a logical public evolution. Right. Meaning doing it out in the open, like people can hear that this has now got more overdubs in it than record one. When I was talking to Felipe Alvarez, who he, he produced like the first few Shakira records, he's done a bunch of great things. Mm -hmm. um, he's from Medellin, like different town, but he was living in Bogota yeah. at, the same, at the time. But basically... When we were talking the other day, he talked about the fact that it's interesting that we all seem to feel compelled, meaning producers like in history, we all seem to feel compelled to sort of present an artist more simply or more sort of just true to form, meaning what walked through the door because our sort of like our immediate impression of them or what got them signed is sort of that initial spark that you're trying to blow on instead of just trying to really like frame it in like a giant fireplace now and build a new like fancy Hogwarts looking fireplace around it. It's like, we just need to like kind of blow on that spark and get it to turn into something. And so it's so interesting how little energy is actually required in the production of like a first statement, mm. meaning that like they've got all these ideas and we have no historical precedent for them so it's about defining who they are. And then it's a logical move to that sophomore record to sort of increase the complexity of what they're saying and how it's being presented, all of it, you know, this, because the story now has a starting point. So we can sort of evolve and make these characters move towards something. It was just an interesting idea that when I then took what he said to me, Felipe said to me and looked back on the way the first highly suspect record, the EP that got them signed sounds a lot like the album that I did for them as their first major label record. Mm -hmm. Very three piece, very sort of like easy to execute live with exactly the members that they already had and what they had available to them. And we kept things, even if there's a sub synth, you know, like secretly put in the chorus of the single, mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it's kept low enough that maybe you would interpret it as a pedal being hit by the bass player because right. things just get bigger and furrier there anyway. And so again, it became, it, it basically was like that the DNA of the tone of the snare on that first EP wound up informing to me all the way out in two dimensions. It went all the way out to like the way they were being presented on a billboard in Times Square or on record two or subsequently record three now, where we wound up with a hit for a rock band on the rock charts at number one, three weeks at number one on the mainstream billboard rock charts above all of our heroes, Foo Fighters, Green Day, Metallica, all these guys. And there were no guitars in it. Yeah. we And it was the first time that it happened since uh, what's his face from the Eagles, <laughs> the main guy. Yeah. It was Don like Henley. the end of the innocence or whatever. Don yeah. Henley's hit in 89 mm -hmm. was the last time that it happened, that there were no guitars in a number one rock hit. Right. And uh, and it was really interesting to know at that point that this mechanism that I'm trying to articulate today in a shorter amount of time than in our, our lessons yeah. is basically ultimately what guided better throughout a band that nobody had heard of going up through having number one hits on each record, 
And then those that historical precedent supported us being able to make a departure and keep it fresh, mm-hmm. you know, like actually sort of repackage it just like Portishead took things in like hip hop that had already existed or things in sort of like Motown or even sort of like old crooner yeah. records or Scott Walker or spy more obscure and... references. Yes, yeah, spy movies yeah. and repackage that as like a new thing. You know, and all of a sudden that worked and they had a gigantic hit, you know, that yeah. nobody loves me. Sour times, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I want to go listen to that record now. It's a great one. That I first quarter said that. Great. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, OK, so uh, I'm going to talk to you for another second. But uh, while we're going over the next thing, um, everybody that's watching on YouTube, drop your questions in the chat. Uh, our own Andrew is in there moderating. So say, hey, Andrew, and uh, drop your questions down there and we'll get to them. Um, So before we move on to that, um, are there any tips that you have to somebody uh, who's maybe producing something that comes in um, on top of what we've already gone over, but uh, somebody, you know, let's say they work at a commercial studio, they're, you know, in the middle of Indiana and they record local bands that come in and they don't really have uh, pre-production meetings and all that kind of stuff. What's mm-hmm. something they can do to, to quickly in the moment find a direction, dial in their aesthetic compass and help the band head toward better? Absolutely. For me, it's creating an environment right away through just the minimal conversation. You're going to have a minute while you're setting up microphones, whatever it is, like you don't have to waste Mm -hmm. time and have a separate meeting. A lot of times I don't, if the band's like flying Mm -hmm. up from Brazil and they don't want to pay for an Airbnb in New York for like three weeks before we actually record, then it's kind of like the pre-production happens as take one, two and three while we help shape it to fit the day. Meaning like get a setup, and listen to your setup with the band, but with the understanding that you're going to go in and listen to their song and and help them guide it through the microphone, help them get what they're trying to say down the wires and remove the idea of, of transducers. Like the mm. suspension of disbelief is what we're actually after here. Absolutely. And, mm. and so ultimately it's like, if you're talking to like a, a band that comes in and they just have like three songs to record. I mean, I've done this. I did this a billion times before I started to get the budgets that I needed to have pre-pro mm. where you just make it clear that you need to listen <laughs> for like the first two, three takes. And it's and even if you just sort of blame it on the idea that you want them to acclimate to the cue system and then start mm. to sort of relax, like they'll already know that you're on their side. You're not just going in and telling them that you want them to give you what you need to make them great. It's like, that's a crazy way to flip it on somebody, especially if they're less experienced as a band. I don't care if they're 60 years old. If you've made more records than them, then you're the one who has the map to the minefield. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You standing behind people and describing where they should step all day in a minefield is never going to instill the same kind of confidence as you stepping out onto it. And when they step in a proven footstep, in a place that didn't blow your toes or leg off or kill you, they're going to go there with confidence. Right. Right. And so ultimately, if you've done a bunch of records and you're holding this map to the minefield, then, then lead. And in the concrete sense, it's like communicate a lot over the talk back, Mike, ask what they're hearing, let them know. Something I'll always say is I'll let them know that I can't hear what they're hearing, but I can help accommodate for what they're hearing. I've got all the tools in here to change what they need changed to be more comfortable, but I can't guess that it sucks or is great or anything. Even if I have my own headphones, I'm not playing the drums while I'm listening to it in the control room. So they might need a slightly different thing than the oboist, you know, or the guitarist or whatever it is. The other people in the band might need a completely different series of variables. And so again, if you have something like a Q mix or a hear back or one of the things where they said it, it might be educational, helping them not feel dumb, helping them feel right. better about being able to get their own mix together. It means taking three minutes, really. It feels like an eternity sometimes when you're in a hurry to track like a, something mm-hmm. without the budget. But three minutes goes a long way in showing that you give a crap about the outcome yeah. and that they're going to feel good about the person when they then have to see you through the glass. Right. They know that it's that same guy or girl that was just in the live room helping 
to guide it towards a better destination. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have better in mind at the beginning, it's like it guides the project all the way through to the end. And in the beginning, you might not even know what it is like in context. So all you know is humanity wants to feel comfortable. Artists want a few very basic things to feel good about the fact that they chose to record with you. Like the same way that you maybe would strike up a conversation on a plane, you can finally sort of find a connecting point. If you both have kids or, Hey, you're on the same flight too. Are you going to Dallas for work or are you just visiting family? You know what I mean? Like there's, there's things that you can do to actually become the host before you then give yourself the space to figure out the aesthetic better you need to create an environment where better is even available because it's never going to happen. You can, you can know it all day. And ultimately, if you're not bringing the band with you, all you're doing is basically using ego to determine better and trying to like rule through some like pedagogical nightmare of just like saying what you do and that's it. And without yeah. a track record that gets hits every single time from yelling at people, you're already like losing. You're already coming from right. way behind to try to convince a band that they should listen to you. And, and immediately, if you're just like, we're all going to play our role in making this better. And we don't know what that is yet. You can be totally honest with them. So let's like do a run through of song one with the mics I chose. And then we'll, we'll budget a little bit of time to then reprioritize the kick drum mic and three other things, not 27 other things. We don't break it all down just to put it all back up. We've already got the lines happening and maybe we just swap out one mic on the kick, one mic on the guitar, and then like the scratch vocal because it's more comfortable to use some 58 shape thing. And all of a sudden what you have is like a step towards defining East. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to bump mm -hmm. into Norway, Morocco, South Africa. You might even miss Africa altogether and wind up in India. And then you wind up finding better together though and if people are confident in the idea that that's where you're headed, they have a massive amount of patience for right. improvement. Right. It's amazing how much patience people have for improvement. If they see it plateau and you're just doing nothing and you're worried about just because like the meters are going over in the Timbaland thing or you're worried about something that has nothing to do with making it better, people have no patience for that. If yeah. they see any advance, like just the snare drum, and if they see any intention being imposed on the room where I go, ah, like light bulb moment, I'm going to put up this kick mic. And they're like, cool, he gets us. Yeah, He understands now what we're trying to say and is making a proactive move. Because again, as a producer engineer, even if you're just producing by default and they haven't even defined you as the producer, you're just the guy or girl putting up microphones in the room at the studio, it's like you're still guiding the destiny of that day. And so therefore, it's so amazing that when you go in the room with intention, it's the same as like if I got on the plane and I saw the, the, the pilot rocking back and forth and like reading flying for dummies, I'm going to like, I'm not going to read that body language as like, wow, this is the one I should definitely stay on and feel good about. Right. <laughs> you know, but if you go in the room with intention and not ego, though, it's a massive like there are grand canyons between ego and intention here in this example. Mm. If you mm -hmm. go in without ego and start to read the cues that like your your heads up, you're not just staring at the meters on the meter bridge or on the screen or whatever. And you see that the drummer is kind of making the I'm struggling face as a human being. Go back in, not even just on the talk back. Go yeah. back in, take the two minutes. And all of a sudden, you'll wind up, it's amazing how people have like infinite patience for their brand of better. And the more yeah. you can recognize that brand and the quicker you can recognize that brand, they'll see that every proactive move that you've made with the whole studio as a discovery tool at that point, when you start then flipping towards proactive decisions from discovery if people see that you're then taking it in a direction towards where they want to be, they're going to sit there and be like, dude, it's cool. Do your thing. We've all had this happen even early in our, our careers and not even knowing why it worked on one session and not on another. If, if you were actually putting out something where people recognize that it was in the service of better, 
they're like, dude, we'll just go out and have a smoke or get water or more coffee or whatever they need to do to justify the three to five minutes that you said you needed to reevaluate like how the toms are or what, yeah. it, what you're doing for overheads. It's amazing how it's not an issue. And yet, if you just sit there all day and don't take any of these little three minute breaks and it sounds like crap when they come in the control room, guess what would have been a really good thing to prioritize right. about an hour before that? would be like talking with them, getting consensus on what they're hearing as basics being something they're excited about. And if you can do it really well, meaning you start to nail that intention quickly and they come in after take two and they're like, man, that sounds awesome. And then you say, if you can give me like slightly less rhythmic divisions on the kick, I can get that like even farther towards the like bigness that's being inferred here. And they go, cool, cool, let's try that. Because you've already established that you understand what they're talking about. And it's a dialogue, man. That's when we start to riff on each other's ideas like we're doing today. Yeah, yeah. Like consensus builds things. Right. You know? Yeah. Creativity absolutely. has consensus in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, that's just huge. Because there's also the other thing, too, like with, um, with like the indie artists in, in, you know, Indianapolis, for example, or whatever, like going into that indie. situation yeah yeah the indian indie. um they uh they they're going into somebody else's like temple of awesome of them or whatever like they come in and they're like yeah i got big speakers behind me and all that like that yep. whole thing it's already like this weird positioning of like you know we're here for our record but everything is kind of about how you're wanting to shape this thing or whatever like letting them know that hey i hear you and we're here for you you know like not my own absolutely ego to make my but, but we're yeah. but we're here for you in a unique chair where we can see something you can't about yourself mm -hmm. and that's the most important distinction is that it's not just a service industry thing like i've said before if somebody comes in and essentially they're like a young band again i don't care about their age they've only made one record before yeah. and they come in and they go okay Joel, you're the doctor now. I want you to take my lungs out because I was coughing all last night. I'd have to use experience and historical precedent that that kills people to remove the lungs from a living human right. and say, <laughs> why don't we try X, Y, or Z for a path towards better? Why don't we use diagnostic ability here, which comes through experience and everything I've learned. Every time I had to cut up a cadaver, I, I never cut it so correctly that it came back to life and didn't have a cough. Right. So let's start with the idea that I at least know that removing it is going to turn you into a cadaver through learning and understanding how people live or die or respirate. And then ultimately, all the rest of this stuff is going to be after that diagnostic happens, it's then prescribing a course towards better. Mm hmm. So it's like if the condition is being that band and doing what they do by default, I need to design a path towards better because as it transitions to two dimensions, it just isn't working. Like the intention fails when it's presented with a change of state. We even use the word. It's transition, transducer, translate to other speakers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like all of it is like it infers a change of state. And we're here to guide that change of state by keeping an eye on the destination rather than staring at them, like using the turn signal and trying to micromanage them down the highway. It's like if we talk about San Francisco and how excited we are to get there from New York when we're driving together the whole way, that stays exciting, enthusiastic and guides the journey in a particular way by reaffirming what we're doing, where we're going, rather than me going, brakes! gas yeah turn signal are you gonna honk at that guy you know what i'm saying it'll be a nightmare what are you doing yeah yeah like yeah. nothing mm -hmm. about that helps it to be safer or get there quicker or better gas mileage it serves nothing about the intention of that journey yeah and people will read that really quickly that if you're serving the intention of a journey you're fun to travel with you know what i'm saying like Absolutely. you you yeah. wind up it's right. like we know it's gonna take a minute to fly to dubai we got you it's 15 right. hours we've done it a million times right. and yet if we have something fun to talk about or we brought snacks or a book that you can borrow it's like it shows that you've been there before and you know what we're all up against and you show that and i don't even know i don't even have to know anything other than that 
better is going to be having something to do in that moment or a distraction just past the time. Right. Right. So this is a thing. That's why this mechanism is so important to me. Meaning like, like the Turing engine is that we do it every single freaking day. Always. We always have an idea of better or worse in any situation we're presented with from a just after birth in relative terms until the day we die. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Otherwise, every single thing would be equal always with no anything ever. Right. <laughs> it's just right. always equal. Every option presented to us would be equal, like being one thing in life versus another or this school or that school or this car or that. I mean, what we do is judge better pretty much always. Right. And we feel justified in it by our sort of moral compass and historical precedent of other cars we've driven. I ride motorcycles and it's like the one I ride, I like the best, you yeah. know what I mean? And it's based on like a million years of riding motorcycles since I was a kid. Right. And that's right. it, that's it. It's definitely not the best or the worst or any of it. It's just one of the options out there that I've invested myself in and I actually spent serious money to get it. So think about what that means to a listener. Mm -hmm. Why would they invest themselves in what you're creating, what you've designed? to be the experience of a representation of the band you're working with. Right. And using that criteria, if you're in the service of compositional intent, I know I've said it a lot today. If you're in the service of that, then you wind up being in the service of everything that the band hopes for by definition. Yeah. You Absolutely. can't not be, you get what I mean? Like if, it, yeah. if the idea is to present it, in the best way possible, then keep an eye on your monitors, keep your ears on your monitors, keep your brain on the goal of that the representation of their snare drum is only the best when it serves the intention of the context they're describing with compositional intention. Awesome. Yeah. That's why we could play 15 different songs with snare drums that sound like Back in Black, then Timbaland, like Missy Elliott era and then like Green Day, and then Joni Mitchell, and then uh, whatever else, you know, like something else from the same paradigm, Billie Eilish. And, and the snares always, it's like, how is that perfect? How did they know that that delay worked good? How do you know when to put a delay on a vocal? And when it serves the greater context, all of a sudden it just sounds right, no matter how much or little mm. I put of it. Right. And if it doesn't, and I just put it randomly on some Nick Drake sounding song. It sounds like I dubbed a Nick Drake song out. Unless the intention is to dub a Nick Drake song, it's going to sound really weird right. in a room with a dude who it sounds like a bedroom with a guitar and a single vocalist happening. It's going to sound weird to my aunt as she drives to work in her Honda Accord. Yeah. You yeah. know? It's like somebody put a magnet next to my compass. Exactly, <laughs> man. Yeah. I got pulled off course. Yeah. Yeah, um, man, there's, there's so many things I could do this for hours as we've done in the past. <laughs> um, we should get to some questions. Yeah, um, please, man. I'm so interested to just hear what anyone wants to know based yeah. on this craziness. Totally. Yeah, okay, so um, we'll start out with, um, let's see, so we got some technical questions here. Here we go. Uh, Best bus compressor for rock. No, yes, kidding. yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Which preamp should I buy? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, loved your talk on intention. What preamp should I buy? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this one is from Diego. Uh, he says, hello, Joel. Uh, would you please talk about artist image? The, comp the compositional intention is there for songwriters that know their north, but how about the ones who are still on the road of finding their voice? Well, we'd have to go all the way back to composition. If you're co-writing something, it's like when I got to co-write something with Tom Waits, He's so on brand that it would have been weird for me, obviously, to try to get him to do a song that sounds like Billie Eilish. Mm -hmm. You know, like I understood because he has a strong brand. And if somebody does not have a brand yet, like in the case of Highly Suspect, when we were putting together a presentation, ultimately, we just had to draw on the macro versus the micro. Like, does the bridge serve the rest of the composition? Is the intro interesting enough to justify its 10 seconds before the vocal comes in and then pulling all the way back to does this actually sound like you look mm. you know like the way mm. that you'll be presented in the marketplace 
might have something to do with it. And we either wind up with something like a, uh, you know, somebody singing something beautiful, but that looks really rugged, like the the Johnny Cash, Rick Rubin record, the black and white picture on the cover of that versus him singing, you know, Hurt is like heartbreaking. It's absolutely yeah. like such a compelling uh, kind of rendezvous between the visual presentation and, and the sound of that. Um, but that's juxtaposition kind of in the same sense as the um, the Portishead thing with like big bombastic drums and then a very small vocal, small sensitive vocal. Um, I do think that there's an element that we don't have to consider unless we're working with management and a label and they have a very specific target in mind for someone's compositions. Meaning it becomes really obvious as soon as they say that 15 minute guitar solo in the middle of this rock song definitely isn't going to fly on alternative rock radio. Then we have sort of like interfacing issues with the pre-existing infrastructure that's going to get it across the river to famous yeah. town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm right, saying? Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and yet, and if that's not being imposed on us, then for me, there's a lot of freedom there in a first record if we set the goals ourselves, then ultimately we would know immediately that if this one was going to be the single and we love the chorus, we love everything about the pacing of it, everything about it just works out perfectly. The key is great for the singer. And yet there's that 15 minute guitar solo in it. We might intuitively know that that's going to be the sandbags on the, on the hot air balloon that keep it from going as high up as we wanted it to go. Mm -hmm. So even just placing hopes on a particular composition can help guide the beginnings of an aesthetic compass. In my opinion, you start to have a barometer for sort of like general climate conditions first, yeah. before you actually start talking about what the altitude is that you're going to fly at. You know right. what I mean? Right. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. Um, Okay, so, oh, interesting. Okay, so this one's from Sam Rostovsky, and he says, you're about to check off two boxes for the three bold choices. So you have two, two bold choices in mind, uh, uh -huh. but not a third. What do you play around with to find the third goal? Well, the, if we're spreading those moves across composition, production, and mix, let's say, engineering, but it's mix in the final presentation of engineering. Um, it means that if people have hit it, like in the Billie Jean example, in one move, the vocal probably could have been 3 dB louder or quieter in that song and it still would have been a hit. You know, there's it, it sometimes it just widens the bullseye when we've hit it in less moves that it takes the importance of the next two phases off of us. So the sort of production vision at that point is to just make sure that that one thing happens loud and clear all the way through to the stamper and ultimately mm -hmm. the masters, you know, get out to the people on the radio hearing bo 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 and And even in that one, we would look at a move in that case that becomes like bold move number two might be temporal in the sense that it takes time to spell it out rather than just a singular element meaning taking away that bass part in the pre-chorus, people always tell me, and the, that mm -hmm. goes away. All of a sudden, everything gets really legato, and we feel like we've been cut loose from that anchor yeah. just for it to return after, hey, hey, and then it comes back, and it feels yeah. like an old friend has removed. That's a big move yeah. to take the thing that happens in 98% of the song and suck it out for a second is a big move. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden that sort of gives you the second move, just removal of the one becomes two. Right. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then yeah. maybe the third move becomes something else that's contained in the vocal as far as like all of the little character pieces that you leave in instead of muting the little noises that Michael Jackson made or whatever. That's mm -hmm. already like we take it for granted, like because it's like mount fuji or the brooklyn bridge out of the corner of my eye it's always there that michael made all those noises and did all the stuff that wasn't the melody and yet it's not actually a part of the written piece so yeah. we're taking liberties with the melody let's say would be move number three we just take it for granted that that's what he did because that is such a like 
piece of infrastructure at this point. It's not even just a song, you know what I mean? Yeah. These classics, we start to forget that these classics were by design. You know, mm -hmm. if, if the producer walked in of Billie Jean and was like, can you just sing the freaking melody for once instead of going <laughs> every two seconds? <laughs> Like if they thought that that wasn't the best path forward, then they would have removed that. There's a mute button. There's asking him not to. There's a bunch of ways that that could have been removed from our experience of listening to Billie Jean. And yet decisions were made in the service of what it meant to be Michael Jackson singing that song in the paradigm it was going to be released, that those were all assets. We don't even know if there was more than that on the original tapes, let's say. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to know that there could have been like 19 guitar solos in the bridge that never made it out because it was designed very specifically to be the one that we now take for granted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, is that something that you do on your productions? I mean, do you do you consciously sit and say, like, what are my three things? You know, I what I've the thing that really set me free in, in the way that I said it before was that when I realized what would be parodied, yeah mm -hmm. let's say by snl because it's an easy one in this country you know yeah mm -hmm. and most people it's like once i started to recognize the things that would be required the fewest number of lines required to draw like the cartoon of my face yeah. and still be recognizable as joel it's like once i saw that then the level of detail that i would include around it was up to me as mix engineer and producer yeah. let's say but it allowed me to budget at the mix bus more mm -hmm. so than just in the production vision. If we're talking about a mix presentation, because mm -hmm. otherwise when we're giving it a voice, it may have been a song, you know, that started as a, uh, an acoustic guitar, but then wound up with strings in it, drums, all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. We're making moves there that again, there's going to, when we slice that down, we've already made one change of state from compositional tool to then there's not even guitar in it at all. But we've gotten strings, a female choir, drums, programming, synths, all this stuff. Then let's slice it one more time and say, well, out of those things that we've taken the place of the original tool for discovery, what's the most important of those things? I'll drill down on it for the fact that like people probably aren't going to sing the like synth pad. They're going to be like, well, when it started and it goes, oh, and yeah. you hear this choir, it's like you're going to give because the gesture is so loud and clear of this almost like churchy moment at the beginning of the song 16 by highly suspect. And then immediately the narrative starts with this, like, you know, underpinning that lets, you know, it's almost like the stereotype of what we would hear in a naval battle sort of slow motion where there's things exploding and the guy looks totally shell shocked. Like he's never going to make it out alive. Right. And then we start to hear the narrative, the narrator kicks in and goes, he knew his life was over. And that's a yeah. pretty compelling start to a movie, like slow motion explosions and a guy that just totally yeah. looks like listless. He's not even trying to escape at this point because he just has accepted his fate that his life was over. It's like that's a compelling way to frame it. And that it's helps me decide through, what, yeah. what those moves would be yet again, based on what we're trying to express in the overarching narrative. Just like Star Wars gave a texture by design to the land speeder, which we we're introduced to that really early in the story. Yeah. Yeah. But someone had to design it to say something. You couldn't just go out and be like, let's get a land speeder that's old and we'll film him driving it. Right. It's like this one looks dented and beat up like some of my friend's parents' cars. And this one looks shiny. It's like, so if we want to say that they come from a household like that, let's do that. But the fact that it doesn't have wheels and floats on air makes it a space vehicle. But we right. get that it's a mode of transportation right away. That's a move that needed to be made. I know I keep going back to the metaphor and the analogy, but it absolutely explains what those three things would be when I decide what they're going to be. Sometimes you have to go to four, five, and six and understand that you are increasing the criteria for people to be able to enjoy it. But you're increasing the passion level when you're making a record that's like with Meshuggah or Slayer or something really challenging that you know my aunt who drives her accord and listens to Bonnie Raitt is going to be like, ah! But it's, yeah. it's, you're going to create a massive amount of passion in a smaller group. We know that this becomes like a subgenre 
we know that this becomes a deliberate move. The goal isn't always to be number one on the charts. Yeah. Sometimes it's to make it as compelling as possible. So we make a movie that's less popular than Star Wars, but makes a bunch of moves that are really challenging, like Eraser Head, and it becomes a quote cult classic. Yep. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And the cult isn't the mass. It's the Exactly. Group. But it's yeah. a really yeah. passionate subsect of the masses, you know? Yeah, yeah. This is the extremists. totally unrelated. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is a totally like unrelated to music analogy to it. But there's a thing in marketing with the same thing. Like if you're doing like Facebook ads or something like that, um, yep. when you start to make your ad, you're, you know, if you say like, I want to advertise to everybody in America, it's like, it's showing you like the potential amount of leads and it's in the, you know, like tens of millions and all of this. And like, you're looking at that and you're like, oh, I'm going to touch a lot of people with this. That's great. That sounds good. But what ends up happening is that ad is completely ineffective because it's shown all these people that don't care about it. But when you start to further identify the demographic and everything, it gets down to the small number, but you end up having like 90% more success with it. Exactly. And so that balance is exactly that. It's the criteria that you would then specify like in a campaign. It's why Mm -hmm. I go back to that, like the DNA of that first snare drum on the first record basically told the PR people what the 2D representation on a billboard needed to be Mm. because it started with us defining what it felt like to experience these like rugged three dudes that happened to be really good looking, but with tattoos and blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden that aesthetic was in line with every move we had made on record one. And it made sense when you were like, Oh, of course that's the guys who make that sound. Yeah. It's like, just like we would expect like, you know, It's why there's the joke a million times over in like kids movies or in any movie, any silly moment where you juxtapose to the point of comedy where like a tiny car has the giant 18 wheeler horn or like a giant 18 wheeler goes meep meep when it goes by. We all go ha 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 because it's like the expectation, the context, the historical precedent is being messed with so much that and so many people have experienced giant truck or train with a really loud horn it's like the horn is like commensurate with the the mass of the thing that carries it right so we we have an expectation just based on the size of the vehicle that it's going to be like this crazy horn when it happens like a giant boat or whatever that you can hear it all through new york city when the qe2 comes in you know if that thing went me me it's like it would be a joke because it's so far away from our expectation That means that like if it's joke is over here and then completely intuitive is over here, that means we've got a lot of shades to play with in between where we're just kind of causing some sort of cognitive dissonance in the middle. And it's just kind of unsettling. It hasn't gone all the way to silly and and interpreted with intention as funny. Right. So it's like those moves can be really extreme as a discovery tool that it's totally not working. And then right. you back off those moves, just crank the wrong thing, turn up the hi-hat all of the, the whole way up and turn everything else down and see if it got heavier. Right. So if right. I can make that obvious example, that means that there are finer shades of like a fader position that's going to equal better to more of that demographic that you're talking about. Right. Absolutely. We can create yeah. criteria with these moves that allow more people to agree that it sounds good. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I love the idea of like focusing that down too. There's also there's a, a whole other thing in um, uh, music business where I think it was uh, I've heard like Bobby Ozinski talk about this uh, on his podcast. And he talks about the um, the idea of only needing a thousand dedicated fans to make a, a pretty good living, like yep. pretty good living off of music because you have these thousand people that are so dedicated to your cause and you have the small cult like following that yep. like if you put out a t-shirt they're going to want it and all of that that kind of stuff again that's like going to business more than art but like the idea that if you niche down to these people you don't have to appeal on a wide scale to connect with people you know and it may happen inadvertently because not everyone writes the song that becomes a hit you mm-hmm. know what i mean or produces the song that becomes a hit it may happen inadvertently but i think it's like if we elevate via production then it always feels right. Yeah. It's that simple. And I I started to have to break down what it meant to elevate, meaning to like make that transition 
from what the band's trying to say to what's actually coming out of the speakers. Mm -hmm. And again, if they're like, if they're a giant boat and they're making a tiny horn honk or they're like a little car and they're making a giant boat honk, it doesn't read correctly in the marketplace. Just like if we opened up a Coca-Cola can and it was orange juice, they're both valid drinks and we would spit it out immediately. It's like based right. on expectation, we would be like, what is wrong with this Coca-Cola? <laughs> and so it's like, if we've messed with the branding like that, like the expectation of the listener, even when it starts at nothing or starts at a picture of the band, because there's going to be some moment of discovery of the act itself or the songwriter or the whatever, we're going to have a particular expectation, even just based on the billboard mm -hmm. of the, yeah. the way they're going to sound. And if it fits in, if you plug in those variables into your algorithmic thinking via ethics, morals, historical precedent, and it's like, wow, these tattooed rocker dudes seem to be something like what I'd probably like in my life. Right. It's, it already gets you like in the direction. So if the snare drum sounds like the type of thing that that billboard is expressing, then we're probably making a good decision as to better when we chose the microphone, gained it up a particular way, wound on a couple frequencies or not, printed it to tape or not. Like when we mm -hmm. designed it to work within a particular context as defined by narrative or compositional intention. Right, right. Actually, those last couple sentences, I mean, that's that's like that could be the most important couple of things that you could say about what makes a mix good or what makes a song good or a performance. Art. Or why is this connected with me? Yeah. Art in general is just yeah. the things that are done through intention. It's just keeps coming back. Yeah. to that, But yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, let's do one more and then I'm going to let you get out of here because we've been keeping you for quite a while. Thank you for all your time on this. <laughs> and, um cool so let's see uh let's go with a pretty lights question so okay this one is from joel legros and he says i love the pretty lights record a color map of the sun and he says mm -hmm. how did you get such a modern punch out of the drums while also retaining this retro feel at the same time can you share any tracking or mixing info for sure there's mm -hmm. it's it's pretty simple it's like playing with that mid character that, that people interpreted as retro and then creating a mid character that feels retro and yet will support a bunch of low end. It didn't then feel dark because there was intention in the composition that gave like a sample that was really bright to balance off this. But mm -hmm. we started here and extended out to the edges. If you listen to the extended, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the deluxe version or whatever they call it, the bonus version, of that record even on streaming services it gives like the initial uh instrumentals that i created live to two track analog that then derek who is pretty lights used to then create the record in ableton he sampled from vinyl we tracked it to two track wow. analog we cut lacquers from the two from those tapes and then he took those records those physical records home sampled from those things i had made for him basically like a sample bank um, but records you know and then he collaged them together to make his record and sent them back to me in the form of a multi-track again but manipulated with ableton and then i mixed it analog on a console again through all a bunch of outboard gear to a tape machine you know right. to a two-track tape machine at 15 ips the first one we wow. printed live was 7.5 ips wow and uh and so basically there was like we were relying on some inherent textures of the capture format because I was doing it on a, a my Neve console, which is in the B room here. And like if you hear a tambourine on it, it's because there was somebody playing a tambourine. There were no overdubs. He didn't want a multi-track. He had always worked kind of as a DJ creating tracks and so wanted to keep that relationship intact. But like being able to rather than just do the dusty fingers like crate digging, we were going to make him a crate. And so getting the people in that he loved that played music. So we'd have like James Gadsden playing drums or Adam Deitch from Lettuce, mm -hmm. Soul Live, you know, like whatever mm -hmm. uh, from Lettuce, I mean, and, and Break Science and a bunch of other things. It's like having these guys playing these grooves together and then finding like when Derek loved it, he would then call it off on like a 58 and just say, okay, it was almost like uh 
the Butch Morris conducted improv thing. If anyone gets that reference, it's pretty obscure. But where there's the idea that he created an entire language of like, hold on that pattern. This doesn't mean stop. You know, it's like what you just figured out within the improv, just stay there and do that. So he sort of would build the foundation by hearing a couple spontaneous interactions and then tell people by conducting to like hold at those patterns. And then he would tell somebody to like evolve or I don't know the hand gestures. Mm, it's a whole packet right. that they give the people before they play. Hmm. And, uh, and ultimately it was kind of like we developed a language like that in the studio in the sense that he could then either verbally just say like Dutch quit playing the kick drum for 10, you know, 12 bars. Cause then he knew that he wanted a sample where there was going to be a different kick that he could lay in there, mm. but along with everything else that was grooving. So there was just like hat and snare with the same groove rather than a mute because it would still be in the room mics or any of this other right. stuff because I was mixing it all live. So if you hear something where there's like a snare blast just on the four, there's like a verb return that comes up or whatever, or like me opening up the oxes. That's me playing the console Amazing. with the groove at the yeah. behest of like me and Derek producing that record. Like technically I co-produced that record and then he produced his record with the record I co-produced to make the sounds. How cool. So uh -huh. we, we basically made this whole thing to exactly be what was described to have the mid character of what I loved about nineties hip hop, where there'd be something crazy filtered to get the kick out of it and crazy filtered to get like the hats out of it. So you could just lay it up against either a drum machine or a different sample that had been scooped to get like the mids out of it in like a Dilla way. And mm -hmm. the, you would have like the hats and the, the kick from that one. And then like an 808 clap layered in on top of that. So you wind up with like this very mid range intensive version of like a parliament sample or, you know, of some pre existing recording laid up against a very full frequency modern drum machine sound with tons yeah. of low end and tons of high end. And I, it, there's something about that that just always was it spoke to me. It resonated with me on in an engineering sense and compositional sense and in the sense that like I could then apply those same basic principles to things I was doing like a lettuce record where it's supposed to sound as big as anything else if it comes on after a Dre song but it's going to have a character that lets you know that we know what the meters records sound like or it lets the listener in on like this is from a different era again like the Amy Winehouse version being probably the most successful version of that the sort of dap tone thing yeah you know but 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 modernized dap tone thing you know right right yeah amazing that record's great definitely wanted to go check out um okay so uh if you have a, a quick second for one more sure we, yeah okay all right cool so uh we can we can make it quick but um this was the uh first question that came in so i feel bad not not okay. getting to it uh, so Enrico says, hi, Joel, drum recording chain for Highly Suspect. I love the natural feel and punch. How much processing on the way in? And were there any additional samples in the mixing stage? Thank you, Enrico. There was tons of processing in the service of it sounding like it just happened in a garage. Mm -hmm. Like, so there was like, because we did it in the A room on the first record. We did it in the A room at, at my place at Studio G. On the second record, we did it in the A room at Audio Vision in Columbia. And in the, uh, the third record, we did it in the A room at Studio G again. And ultimately, what we wound up with was something that just described the events in a way that felt right to us based on the song. Yet again, you, you guys all know where I'm going to go with this. Yeah. The particular sound served the idea that it's like it's gigantic, but it's not gigantic and particularly shiny. So if there's like a big rusty robot with like some, you know, holding like a telephone pole as a nightstick because it's so huge, just smashing things, that was going to be much more sort of intimidating to me than rock that sounds like it was made on a laptop with Ableton and a couple Kempers. Right. So for me, it was like we wanted something that felt like it had a chance to explode. And there's no chance that my programming or triggers are ever going to explode or distort yeah on the way in if you think of it that way in the compositional phase right and so when i'm trying to give the the two-dimensional representation of what it meant to have this like tattooed dude like hitting the drums yeah. really hard 
but in a space that's raw. It's not like in Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. It's not in Abbey Road. It's not in anything. It's not in the village. You know, it's like, I want you not to picture anything that Storic designed or Roger Vase or any of that, like, you know, and, and so we need a neutral starting point designed by Storic or Roger Vase. Yeah. Storic designed audio vision is why I mentioned him. And so mm. basically it's like, if we start with that sort of neutral ish sound, at least a balanced decay property, and then I add a Lindrum snare using the analog trigger ins and I make it really dark and use the top end character of the live snare and just the mm. of the Lindrum tuned down. And I put a Bricasti 0.75 verb on it on just the Lindrum. Then it sounds like the room has gravel in it. Right. Instead of that, I like then use the sample of like dirty O3 or whatever on some <laughs> like drum sample thing. Mm -hmm. Or I use the trigger that was just like the default Noble and Cooley on Drumagog or whatever mm -hmm. and, and, and wound up like tuning a couple of the samples down. So there was some randomization even more than what it does dynamically. And ultimately we wind up with something that I can EQ and it doesn't have any hi-hat in it. But so I'm just using it to sort of give the bottom snare a bit more brightness so yeah, there was triggers layered in with, not even with the kick though, weirdly, never with the mm. kick on the specific stuff, which is weird because mm. I do it often, but it just happened to work out that the kicks we used worked right. And there was a ton of processing on the way in, but just like I said earlier, like the idea of committing, it's like I knew where it was going. So it'd be like, I don't want to commit to this whole San Francisco idea yeah. that you have yet. So I'm just going to drive around the block or like, I'm going to go north before we actually go west to get to California from New York. Like, if you know where we're fucking going, go drive towards it. Right. I don't need you to be like, oh, this is kind of a committee thing. So we'll figure it out as we just waste gas and resources and time and energy and get bored of the car driving 10 hours, not in the direction that we all know it's going. Clearly, it's not a discovery tool anymore for me if I know where this record is headed. Mm. It means I can make decisions right in the beginning for compositional intention and how it's going to transition to 2D and then tell the story. We've never heard a snare drum right. on a record. We've heard a representation designed to sound like the right snare drum for that. And you can change the source to do it and you can do all kinds of things. But ultimately, it was designed in the service of these other two elements here. And so I used everything I needed to use to make it sound like these dudes were just raging in a space where there might be some torn curtains and like some people that are drunk or some broken beer bottles in the corner of the show by the end of it. Yeah. And, and spoke to the humanity of what they were expressing, even in the lyrical narrative, which is a literal direct connection to what's being said rather than just some esoteric idea, even though it's not that esoteric, that the texture of the sounds themselves are going to tell a story before the narrative of the vocal spells out in English. Mm -hmm. Somebody listening to it who doesn't speak, speak English should get the idea that something angry or thoughtful or caring or aggressive is being expressed right off the bat. And they would by the timbres chosen starting with compositional intention. They grabbed a distortion pedal. It fit what they were trying to say. Right. Yeah. If we can accept that that one move makes sense to us, then we can accept that every other EQ move, every other microphone choice, every other thing I did in the service of it, if I'm recognizing that the grabbing the distortion pedal and turning it to a particular place where it sounded right to the singer, that's a massive clue right there as to what my job is going to be to getting it to come out of your speakers and tell the story in a way that's in line with what they hoped. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'd love and, to finish there. Yeah. Yeah. You have that whole like picture in your head, though, as you're driving forward. That's the whole thing that's that's really amazing and just just awesome about you moving toward that picture of like the, the torn curtains and everything. And that was how you steered the ship. That's amazing. <laughs> Joel, Man, thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. I learned so much Thanks every time everybody. I talk to you. And yeah. Awesome, um, man. And I look forward to just for more chatting this. in general, because we always seem to kind of discover new ways of triangulating on this, which is ultimately what we're doing. I mean, you know, yeah. people have recorded records before and we're trying to do it our way and, and make a dent 
in a way that's maybe not been done before. And it doesn't mean we can just be crazy about it. It means that we're going to lean on these cultural touch points like great sounding records before us mm -hmm. and hopefully find a way to repackage it yeah. in a way that connects with as many people as possible with compassion and empathy in my heart. That's what I hope yeah. to do as a producer. So, right. Amazing. Thank you for chatting about that today. Of course. Yeah. Uh, calibrating the aesthetic compass. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, man. Joel, if people want to go uh, dive in deeper with you, uh, where do they where do they do that and how do they find out more about your one-on-one -on -one thing? And Hit me up via Instagram yeah. first. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's the easiest place is like, just find me Joel Hamilton on Instagram and then, and then wind up being, you know, we can talk about the first round of whether it's right for, for them, you know, like rather, mm -hmm. whether it's something that would resonate with them and then we can jump off that and go to email, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's great. Awesome. Uh, also, everybody check out Studio G in Brooklyn. Uh, just an amazing place with a huge history. You guys just hit a huge milestone recently, right? With how long you've been open? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, this is we started in 93. Yeah. You know, and, and we've expanded almost almost literally exponentially since about 2000. Yeah. Like meaning doubling every year you know and uh and it's and we're just about to build one of the largest rooms in new york city we're up to studio f so we have an a room we have a through e online right now mm -hmm. and functioning and then we're we're about to build the f room we're, we're working our way, way back up to g yeah and basically nice. it's like but this f room is going to be killer it's historic is designing it mm -hmm. it's basically like an orchestral room uh tied to two different uh control rooms it's it's just going to be killer it's going to be a really wow. killer space and we're excited about it and we're now at you know we're a 10,000 square foot facility here in New York so as a facility we we're we are the biggest one basically and um it's just been exciting because it's it's using things like we talked about today rather than just what EQ we're using that has brought us like a, a massive expansion in the face of lots of places closing yep. and all of that. So maybe it's time for us all to sort of rethink the paradigm and not just concentrate so much on which compressor we're using, but why we're using it. Amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Joel, thank you for sharing <laughs> this with all of us. Um, I, I, would love to encourage you to write a book about it. <laughs> I would At some point, I need a few more gray hairs in this beard before I'm going to actually get into writing a book, man. Well, you'll be at them then. Yeah. Nice. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, Thank you so much, man. Be well. Time. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Joel. Bye, everybody. Thank you.